Good morning, everyone. British Columbia is at a crossroads. We have a premier who broke the, his own election law, selfishly called an election in the middle of a global pandemic to benefit his own political interests, not the people of British Columbia. People are struggling in every corner of our province. Many are out of work, many having to turn down work to care for loved ones, and many others wondering if they'll have to close the doors of their small businesses forever. Instead of helping these people, John Horgan and the NDP have essentially shut down government for a couple of months for political gain at a time when help is most needed. The pandemic power grab serves nobody other than John Horgan and the NDP. Our economy is in decline. Unemployment is high. Donations to vital charities and nonprofits are down. Businesses are closing. And irreparable damage is being done to our local communities. And the cost of living just keeps, up, keeps on climbing. Every small business that shuts down equals people out of work and an owner and their family in financial trouble, and a closed up storefront leaving holes in the heart of our local neighborhoods. Families in my community of Port Moody, Coquitlam, are telling me that it is time, that this is not time for an election. It is time for action, and I couldn't agree more. It is time to restore the confidence and rebuild BC. Everything you addressed about the economy is true. More difficult times lay ahead under John Horgan and the NDP's poor leadership. I see the social and community impacts every day in Maple Ridge, and I see it getting worse in Mission. Yesterday, while serving dinner to many people in my community, challenged with addiction, mental health, and poverty, I couldn't help but get slapped in the face with exactly how much worse things have gotten under this NDP leadership. As a result of the NDP's focus on warehousing people, they neglected the need for clinical supports and abandoned these people at the door. In my community, the increase in crime has made people feel unsafe. These facilities are often beside seniors' housing and families, and they are not working. The NDP's permissive attitude towards illegal camps shows how little regard they have for all citizens, those needing support, and the community as a whole including local governments that are often left trying to pick up the pieces from broken policies. Everyone is a victim. The vulnerable people who are let down by a government not interested in helping them move forward in their lives. The current system forces them to be surrounded by crime, substance abuse, and even violence. Families living in neighborhoods and warehousing facilities are also subject to crime, theft, substance abuse, ongoing first responder attendance, and social challenges that prevent them from the peace they once had in these neighborhoods. These ongoing challenges leave them feeling broken. They are victims. Small businesses in Victoria, Vancouver, Nanaimo, and Maple Ridge are being forced to deal with abuse, harassment, and large amounts of theft from people who really just need clinical care. These small businesses are victims too. We need a caring and compassionate approach that will help everyone. The BC Liberals are that approach. We are putting forward a very bold vision for our province to get everyone back on track and help everyone through this pandemic. The team that is going to restore confidence, rebuild BC, is the BC Liberals under the leadership of Andrew Wilkinson. Well, thanks, Chelsea. Thanks, James, for being here. And thank you, everybody who's attending this uh, press conference remotely. Today, we're delighted to roll out our platform so that everyone will have a clear idea of our vision for British Columbia as we look forward to this election less than two weeks away. It's important to remember, though, why this election is happening in the first place. Despite having the confidence of the legislature and his agreement with the Green Party, despite having all three parties working together in a trusting relationship to fight back the virus, John Horgan selfishly decided to call an election. He broke the trust that the other parties had put in him to govern for a year to come to get us through this pandemic. And he broke the trust of the people of British Columbia. In response to this, part of our platform is to establish a BC pandemic response committee, including all three parties and Dr. Henry, in a collaborative approach to manage and anticipate 
future pandemics. We've got to get through this one, and we're delighted that we hired Dr. Bonnie Henry a few years ago, and I would hope to continue working with her as a fellow physician. We will provide the provincial aid and supports to small business to keep our small businesses alive through this pandemic. We will also prepare legislation related to BC's fixed election date to limit the Premier's ability to manipulate election dates for partisan benefit and ban early elections during provincial emergencies. It is unthinkable that in the middle of a provincial emergency, John Horgan broke the trust of the parties in the legislature and the people of British Columbia to call this self-serving election. Over the last few weeks of this campaign, it's become more and more apparent that John Horgan called this election solely in a cynical grab for power because he cares about his political career more than what's best for BC. The concern we all have is that there really is no plan from the NDP to move British Columbia forward to get us through this pandemic. Aside from four more years of power, they can't really tell us why they want to be in office. Their platform has no bold ideas or serious action to get BC back on track, and particularly no benefits or hope for small business. There are serious issues facing this province, like those mentioned by James and Chelsea moments ago. They fail to be addressed by what John Horgan has laid out as the promise, province continues to face the challenges of COVID-19. We re need real leadership now, competent, calm leadership to take us into the next century once we get through COVID. Unlike John Horgan and the NDP, the BC Liberals are putting forward a plan that British Columbians can get excited about. The BC Liberals have a plan to make people's lives better every day and to build BC for the challenges of tomorrow. Unlike John Horgan, who's content to bribe people for their votes with their own tax dollars, the BC Liberals have a vision for the next four years to get British Columbia back on its feet and particularly focus on small business, tourism and hospitality as the most vulnerable parts of our economy that need to have the support of government. We need to rebuild confidence and we need to rebuild BC. We need a British Columbia that creates opportunity for everyone that does not ever divide British Columbians into friends and enemies of the NDP. That's just plain wrong. We believe in getting everybody's life in better shape once we get through COVID. We need to create jobs in every part of our province. We need to get people back to work and attract new investment from both within and outside British Columbia, which is something the NDP never seemed to find the time to talk about. We need a plan that helps working parents trying to earn a living by providing them with affordable daycare. We need a plan that helps our parents and grandparents get better care and to age in place in their own homes with the kind of supports that lead them to be safe and secure in the comfort of their own home as long as possible. We need a plan that gives drivers a choice so that they can have cheaper auto insurance. And we need to make our communities safer, reduce crime, and take care of the people who are left on our streets in a most vulnerable state because of mental illness, because of addictions, because of brain injury. It's just not acceptable that the NDP have bundled them up and put them into rundown motels as the only solution. We need to build our future and we need to make record investments in infrastructure, which is exactly what we're talking about, in hospitals, schools, transportation, and affordable housing. So what's included in our plan? Let's start about the economy. We're going to eliminate the provincial sales tax completely for a full year, giving the average family $1,721 in their pockets so that they can reinvest in themselves and help small business to get ahead. We'll reduce that tax to 3% in the second year as the economy recovers. We'll also be eliminating completely the small business income tax, which will allow small businesses to reinvest in people and in the facilities they operate so they can actually get ready for prosperity. We want our small businesses to stay open, to keep employing people and make it possible to get ahead as they serve our community through the pandemic and afterwards. We're also creating a loan guarantee program for the most vulnerable sector of our economy, which is tourism and hospitality. 
Many of us know flight attendants, pilots, hotel workers, tourism operators, tour guides. They're all unemployed and they're worried sick about their future. We need to give them hope that we'll get them through this winter, we'll get past the vaccine, and we'll have a booming tourism business once again. And they will not be abandoned by the side of the road under the NDP. We need to avoid a complete collapse in our tourism industry. And that's what we are dedicated to do, to make sure that hospitality, restaurants, and tourism have the future that we want for them so that they can proudly showcase BC to the world and make a good living in the process. Those industries will also benefit from the PST cut that we've outlined and also from the cap on uh, delivery fees of 15% for food delivery services. Let's talk about caring for people too. Our primary goal here is to make sure that people who are trying to get back into the workforce with children have the ability to do so. That requires affordable daycare. If you've been living on federal payments for six months, and it's going to go for much longer than that, we all know, there's going to be that awful feeling of, I've got little kids, can I get back to work, or is the cost of daycare going to make it impossible? We don't want that vicious cycle of unaffordable daycare, can't get back to work, and stuck at home. It's just soul-destroying for people who find themselves in that trap. So our real plan for $10 a day daycare will make a real difference. The NDP promised $10 a day daycare in the last election, and it's been a complete and absolute failure. The only spaces available at that price are federally funded pilot programs that provide for only 2% of daycare spaces at that price. And of course, after the last election, John Horgan said, that his $10 a day daycare program was really just a slogan. They really had no ability or interest in following through. Well, it's not a slogan for the BC Liberals. We have allocated budget space to say that anybody, any family making $65,000 or less will have $10 a day daycare. Any family with up to $90,000 of household income will then have $20 a day daycare. And any family up to $125,000 family income We'll have $30 a day daycare. This is essential to getting our communities back to work, to giving people a sense it can be done. We will get ahead. We will make this work. Because childcare should not be a barrier to parents, parents need to be able to earn a living. And that's what we are guaranteeing. We'll also provide something that is bedeviling everyone looking for childcare which is running around to dozens of different outlets, different applications, different fees, phoning again and again and again to find out if they've got a place. And for the operators, they're fielding phone calls and dealing with applications using up far too much of their time. We did it with higher education, with 435,000 students in the system using educationplannerbc.ca. And we can do the same thing for daycare operators and families applying for daycare. A single place to apply, a single deposit, no application fees, just the ability to get orderly uh, provision of daycare in a process that doesn't drive you crazy with the process itself. We're also announcing today that our intention is to fund and build and fit out an additional 10,000 daycare spaces. We've talked to the operators. They've told us the cost of upgrading lease space. There's publicly available space that can be upgraded. We can do this, and we have to turn our minds to it, because the Quebec experience has been with properly funded daycare. People get much more active in the economy. More women are employed in the economy than ever before, and government revenue actually goes up. This is a very good thing because we need to grow and expand our economy as we come through COVID. And the best way to do that is to say that every working parent will have access to affordable daycare in their own community. At the other end of the care spectrum, we've allocated $1 billion over five years. That's $200 million a year to provide for seniors facilities to be upgraded to private rooms for anybody who wants one. This will control the spread of disease. It will lead to a better way of life for our seniors, and it's a very sound investment. 
We've also said, as I said earlier, the best form of senior care is in the comfort and security of their own home. We need to make sure with a tax credit system that seniors can apply for and receive tax credits for things like home repairs, housekeeping, and home care. So we're suggesting that that form of aging in the right place in their own home be supported with a tax credit of up to $7,000 a year on up to $20,000 of expenditures. So our seniors who've worked so hard for so long can age as long as they want to in their own home before seeking a further level of care. In terms of public safety, we have to do better in caring for our society's most vulnerable people. As a medical doctor myself, I can see people on the street and have a sense of what the disorders are that are troubling them, of the disease states they're suffering through, of the brain injuries that aren't being addressed. We have got to do better. The NDP's approach is to lump all these people together. And as one of their cabinet ministers said, if you scoop people up and put them in a rundown motel, it's not going to work. And that's exactly what the NDP have been doing. And they don't seem to have learned the lesson from Victoria, from Vancouver, from Kelowna, that this approach is a failure. Our streets are more disorderly than ever. Vulnerable people are being preyed upon by criminals. And the level of street disorder is unacceptable. We will build a real pathway to get people with addictions off drugs. And let's be clear, these are people suffering from addictions. It's a medical disorder. It needs to be treated, and that's what we will do. We will end the tent cities and get people the services and supports they need to get off life on the streets. We cannot be in a society, regardless of the pandemic, where the only treatment for schizophrenia is a tent. That's cruel, it's inhumane, and it's not acceptable. We will do better. We've allocated $58 million to assist with public safety. It starts with hiring 100 psychiatric social workers or psychiatric nurses to work with the police agencies to put together the mobile units that are available all year round, all day, to go and address mental health issues that the police are so often called to because people don't know where else to turn when there's disorder in their communities. In addition, we will fill the 200 empty police slots around British Columbia to make sure that order on our streets is reestablished. We're seeing horrifying growth in crime in some communities. In Victoria, the level of street disorder is unprecedented. In Vancouver, a 21% increase this year in aggravated assault and assault with a weapon. People being chased down the street with a chainsaw. People finding assault weapons fully loaded in a back alley in, in Strathcona. This is not acceptable. It cannot be a new normal. So we will institute the necessary services, both in terms of psychiatric social workers and psychiatric nurses, and the policing resources necessary to reestablish order in our streets. These are called integrated mobile crisis response teams. They're well established in Kamloops, to a lesser degree in Prince George, and also Vancouver and Victoria. And we will expand those programs throughout the province. The NDP's policy of warehousing these most vulnerable people has failed. Even they accept that. And so it's time for us to turn a corner and treat people with the respect they deserve because we're all citizens of British Columbia and we can do better. In terms of affordability, far too many people are finding that the cost of housing is simply insurmountable in Metro Vancouver. And it's not just in Vancouver, it's now in Victoria and Kelowna in other centers around the province. We've seen the cost of housing go up and up and up to record highs under the NDP. In spite of all their warm intentions, in spite of their best wishes, their process has failed. So what we're talking about in terms of housing is to drastically increase the supply of housing so that people can afford to find a place to live. We've got to provide the forms of housing that people are looking for. A six-bedroom house is no longer useful for most people in our society. What they're looking for is an affordable place to live, preferably near transit. And there's another element of affordability. Half the people in Metro Vancouver live in condominiums. And their condominium insurance under the NDP has gone through the roof. This was brought to the attention of the NDP in the last year, and they did nothing 
to bring down the price of condo insurance. And in fact, they had a windfall with their 4.4% tax on condo insurance, which went up anywhere from 40 to 400%, suddenly filling the NDP's coffers with a windfall profit from condominium owners. This is wrong. So we will take action quickly to get a more sensible insurance market going for condominium owners with the advice that we've received from the industry of real steps that can be taken for things like self-insurance and mutual insurance to give people the break they need. In terms of housing, we're going to be talking about zoning reform and incentives to municipalities with policies that increase the construction and supply of new housing because we cannot just stand still when British Columbia's population has been going up by 60,000 people a year every year for the last 40 years. The NDP's approach assumes that the population is static and it's just unsupported by the facts. We're also going to make sure that people have choice, real choice, in car insurance. It works in other provinces, there are good models across Canada, and there's no reason why you can't have a choice. The NDP seem to think that ICBC is the one and only choice that you should be allowed. And we say, what possible objection is there to saying you get to choose between two different things? ICBC no fault will be, still be a choice, but you'll have other choices, and that's what you're entitled to here in the province of British Columbia. We're also going to reduce the cost for young drivers by doing what they do in New Brunswick, by requiring that new drivers get given two years credit on their uh, driving record, and those who finish driver education get four years credit, so their fees will be lower in those first few years, so they can get out and build their lives. Most of us have been in that state of getting a driver's license for the first time and realizing now I can get a part-time job. Now I can go to that college that's on the outskirts of town. Now I can make it workable. That's the goal, is to have every British Columbian feel that government's working for them rather than what we've seen the last two years is that young people's dreams being ruined by ICBC. There's also this issue that has come up a couple of weeks ago, the NDP, said that they were going to make sure that your excessive premiums for 2020 were refunded, but only if they got elected. I was quite pleased to point out, it's not the NDP's money we're talking about. It's not even ICBC's money. These excessive premiums have been refunded everywhere else in Canada except BC. ICBC holds that money in trust for you, the drivers of British Columbia, and they need to refund it immediately. In terms of infrastructure, we know that people in certain parts of this province, whether it's in the suburbs of Victoria or in the southern uh, regions of Metro Vancouver or the eastern regions of Vancouver out to the Fraser Valley and even in Kelowna, spend far too much time commuting on congested roads. So we're committed to major projects to get people moving again. This will also employ people as we pull through this recession and it's done with funds that government can borrow at extremely low interest rates, so it makes perfect sense at this time. We will fund the replacement of the George Massey Tunnel with a proper bridge, and construction can start immediately because the NDP foolishly and irresponsibly cancelled that project three years ago. It's time to get it going again and relieve the biggest traffic bottleneck in Western Canada. We will complete the sixth landing of Highway 1 to the Whatcom Road in the Fraser Valley, to relieve the second largest traffic gridlock in British Columbia in the Fraser Valley. And we'll be expanding public transit options throughout British Columbia, as well as the hours of operation in places already served by transit. And as we transition into the future, all of us know the days are numbered when oil will be driving our transportation systems. We've got to anticipate that and build into the future, make sure we have enough electricity, first of all, and secondly, have electric charging stations around the province for electric vehicles. We've got to start thinking of where we'll be in the next 10 years, not in the next 10 weeks, and, or as John Horgan says, let's talk about 2050. We need to talk about real things get built now, and that's what we're proud of as a record as BC Liberals. We'll be adding an additional $8 billion investments in infrastructure over the next three years. This will be the biggest infrastructure investment in BC's history because we need it now, interest rates are low, and it will put people to work. We're preparing to employ more than 35,000 people in infrastructure. 
partly because in September, Stats Canada reported that 15,000 people lost their jobs in BC in construction, and we can do better. We're looking at those record investments in transportation, hospitals, primary care clinics, seniors care, mental health treatment, and housing. And in particular, we are committed to that second hospital in Surrey that the NDP talk about endlessly but never produce. Let's not forget the NDP in their 13 years in power in the last 30 years never built a single hospital. We built 14. When we say we're gonna build hospitals, we do it, we deliver, and the evidence is all over British Columbia. So in conclusion, we can say that COVID-19 has changed many, many things in our lives. We need a government that's prepared to show leadership and respond to these challenges head on. We're at a major crossroads in our society where we've got to work together to build that future. No friends and enemies like the NDP uh, refer to. No winners and losers. No one to be penalized. We've got to build a future that involves all of us. Our road leads to opportunity, and the NDP proposed road leads to stagnation. It's time to turn the page on three years of John Horgan and the NDP. It's time to get to work on writing the new chapter for BC. It's time to restore confidence and rebuild BC for our future and for future generations to come.